Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Bhutang tamang sankang namasami John Amaro invited me to say a few words upon returning from uh, a long trip overseas with Lumpal. It's certainly very nice being back in Amaravati. It feels like home. Even though the trip itself was by no means unpleasant. It's really nice being being back here. Alumpo travels surprisingly well at his age, at 88. The pace of movement and activities has to be adapted to his uh, energy levels. But that being said, he's got incredible stamina at his age. He's given a very impressive amount of Dhamma reflections along the way, starting back in Seattle, his hometown, Gave a very nice talk there at the Seattle First Baptist Church. Quite a few people gathered there listening to him all the way until the we spent the second Vasa <coughs> uh, in Temple Monastery in New Hampshire. And he offered reflections every Sunday. offering reflections every Sunday there and did a couple of Q&As, met with the monastic community half a dozen times just to answer questions with a few guests. And it's very inspiring to see how, how generous he is with his uh, time, with his insights, sharing his experience. It's also very beautiful to see how happy it makes him to share Dhamma. It was one of the reasons he chose to come back and live here, because he feels more comfortable teaching in English. In Thailand, he always had some resistance to accept invitations to teach Dhamma in Thai because that means work, finding the words and feeling unsatisfied with the limited vocabulary he had. But being back here in England and in the US, he could really just express himself. It obviously gives him a lot of joy. So coming back here feels like being back home, but also feels like just touching base before moving on again. uh, In early December, in about just over three weeks, Lumpa is off again for two and a half months to mainly visit Thailand and attend the opening of the Uposara Hall in Wat Chat, which was the first monastery he founded. So he's very happy to attend that and give Ajahn Kivali his encouragements.
It's also very moving to witness as I have the privilege of traveling with him <clears throat> and have had for the past, what is it, 10 years now. Going to so many places and just about every place we go, there's always someone who comes up to him with tears in their eyes and their voice choking up coming up to say thank you because they've been reading his Dhamma and listening to his talks for 20, 30 years and it's changed their lives and it was the first time they have the opportunity to say thank you in person. And it's just a very moving experience to see how many people's lives he's touched with his teachings through his example. I myself feel incredibly privileged, honored, and lucky to be in the position I am in, being so close to him. It was very interesting to see the opportunities for practice that arise and how practice unfolds in this kind of situation. Remembering how the Buddha describes the, the three levels of wisdom, like memorizing teachings, hearing teachings, memorizing them, thinking about them is the first level, and then slowly learning to integrate what we've memorized and compare it to our experience, and how it relates to our experience, the second level, and then when we've brought it into the heart, letting the Dhamma guide our heart and how wisdom is revealed once we're settled in the heart, in the silence, and we can just watch the present moment happen. And for me, it's very, uh, it's very beautiful to realize how that has been guided by Long Paul's teaching. the very personal stories he shares, but also the incredible number of skillful means he has come up with to deal with life, to deal with experience, with what comes up in the mind. Hearing him talk about it and then really bringing it in and learning how to use it, trying to figure out how to use these tools that he talks about, which he has had so much success with. A simple example is how he talks about in intentionally thinking and noticing the silence, the pause between the thoughts, noticing consciousness, aware of thinking and then being aware of no thinking. And it's such a simple exercise, such a simple tool, and he's talked about that many times. <clears throat> but to actually put it in practice and discover how efficient it is, how, how deep how deeply it opens up insight. It's, it's a wonder, really. One thing that was interesting is uh, coming here 
There's this tradition of having a personal retreat time or self-retreat time, whatever it's called. And then in uh, Jitawana in New Hampshire, they do the same during the Vasa. And I'm often asked if I'd like to have some three weeks a month of solo time. Most of my time in Thailand, we didn't train with that. as an, It wasn't an option. In Thailand, very often, you just follow the routine in the monastery and learn to use the practice just with daily life as it is. And they not, don't very, not many monasteries offer solo retreat time. So I experienced that when I was a novice and my first vasa as a monk, and that not anymore. And I remember loving it very much, finding it very useful, as well as pleasant. But what I've also discovered, looking after Lumpal, there was a period, it was about eight years ago, I think, when uh, he was moving into his early 80s. <clears throat> and it became apparent that it would be good if someone, would, someone stayed in, the, in his kuti and the downstairs rooms in case he needed help. And so being his kind of secretary and main upatak, uh, I was invited to do that and I was very happy to. But then I discovered that as nice as it is to have a, a room in a building with electricity, a fan, which is a precious commodity in Thailand, a bathroom with uh, running water and hot water. I missed my kuti up in the forest. And sometimes I'd find myself pining for that solitude that I experienced living at the end of the path, down one end of the monastery. And that feeling of seclusion, of being away from everything and everyone But it seemed selfish to kind of put that before looking after Lumpur. But fortunately by then I kind of had heard his teachings often enough to remember that we can't help the way we feel. So I kind of looked at that and just noticed it as just a feeling arising. And as soon as I just watched it as that, I didn't miss the kuti so much anymore. The feeling was still there, but I didn't feel I had to agree or disagree with it, follow it, or have to think otherwise, or feel guilty for thinking that way. And then this has come up very often over the years, traveling with him as well. Because sometimes traveling for six months, living out of a suitcase, spending 10 days here, six days there, a few days on the road, and then being on the move all the time. On one hand is fun, but on the other hand it gets tiring. The feelings arise that I just want to stop and settle down somewhere, put down some roots, breathe a bit, And I learned to recognize those the same way I recognize that pining for the solitude of a kuti. It's just more feelings arising in the mind. I can notice that here, coming here and arriving here is taking two days to unpack and catch up on jet lag and sleep. And then I'm here. And I know that in about three weeks, I'll be packing again to go off to Asia. And just watching what that does to the mind. And so, coming back to that opportunity to have three weeks or a month of 
personal retreat time. It's interesting to reflect on that. So I haven't, I've never taken up that invitation. Partly because Lompa, being 88 years old, as many elderly people know, or as if anybody's cared for an elderly person, you notice that elderly people really appreciate a steadiness of help. If they get someone who's looking after them, they get to feel comfortable with them, to trust them, and that they know that their carer knows them, knows their limitations, their abilities, their preferences. And it's very reassuring to have that. And I can see Lumpo as formidable as he appears when he's talking about Dhamma. When he goes back to his kuti, he's also just an 88-year-old man. And his balance is not so good, and his eyesight is not so clear, and his hearing is not all that sharp. And there's a sense of vulnerability, of fragility there. So I've taken the occasional trip back home to visit my parents and whatnot, and he's very adaptable. He knows how to adapt to a change in when I leave and someone else comes and look after him. But I can see that he really looks absolutely delighted when I get back because the guy who knows me well is back and I feel safe now. And it's really quite moving to see that. So one of the reasons I kind of declined the invitation to take retreat time is because I don't feel I can do that to him. But the other reason is also because I've discovered that whatever our conditions are, it was the case when I was a junior monk undergoing my period of training until I was five vasas, and then the early majima years when I was able to explore different possibilities, spend some time in Wat Papong with Lumboliam. After a few months, he sent me to a very secluded monastery out in the middle of nowhere, where I was just living with three other monks in the hot of, in the heat of the hot season, doing some tudong, and then being with Lung Pao. The one constant thing that arises is what we just chanted earlier the Dhammachaka Sutta, desire, wanting things to be a certain way, not wanting to be them to be the way they are. And that's basically what the practice is about, mm. learning to recognize that. And then just letting go, letting, letting things be the way they are letting things not be the way we want them to be. And I get as much of that in my situation as Lumpa's secretary and Upatak as I would if I went off and did my own thing. So I feel that in terms of opportunities to practice, being on retreat is certainly a very beautiful thing to do. Being tied up with duties is an incredible, incredibly valuable experience in terms of learning to recognize within that likes and dislikes, wanting, not wanting, preferences, and learning to recognize them and let go of them. That often makes me think of people who take on the duties of abbotship, such as Ajahn Amaro, Ajahn Ahingsuko, and they're basically giving everything up. They don't do much what they want anymore. They do what they need to do. And it's a very, it's a very beautiful aspect of service. So in, in my case right now, it's in, in service to Lumpa. 
recognizing which parts of these conditions are a blessing due to the particularities of this condition, being close to Lumpur, getting to hear a lot of Dhamma, have encouragements, being able to just watch him, how he deals with solitude, how he deals with business, receiving guests, how he deals with old age, the patience and equanimity he brings to it. So there's a wealth of teachings there, just in witnessing his example. But also in, in the willingness to serve, or giving the opportunity to think of something else than me, what I would like to do, what I would prefer. Do I want to retreat? Do I want some solo time? Do I want my kuti up in the forest? They're very good things to do. But somehow, the common thing there very often is me. And I never seem to be quite as happy when I'm doing something for me as when I'm doing something for someone else. And so serving, offering service, as looking after Lung Po, over the years has revealed itself to be an incredibly beautiful opportunity because I'm constantly offered the opportunity to put me aside and do what I need to do for Lung Po or for the guests who are wishing to see him, when he comes to give a talk, or whatever it is. So sometimes I can get extremely busy days, many in a row, and then other days seem quite ordinary and quiet, whatever the routine in the monastery is. But very often those days I rarely have more than two hours to myself. Every two hours there's something comes up in relationship to Lung Pao. And just about every single day, the state of mind arises where, oh, I just like to stay here and continue relaxing, doing nothing, taking a break. I need to catch up on sleep. I want to do some more walking and sitting, experience more peace of mind. Whatever that range of wish is that arises in the mind, they arise every single day. And yet every single day I have the opportunity to just go put that aside. It's time to go and see Lung Pao. It's time to take care of something relating to him. And on top of the fact that it is for him and is very beautiful and precious to have the opportunity to serve him, it also is every single time the opportunity to put me aside. And so far, I haven't found a single case where I've regretted doing that. Whereas there are a few times when I said, ah, he won't mind if I come an hour late. And I do regret those occasions. So there are many, many ways in which serving really is a blessing. And here in the monasteries we have an opportunity to, we have these opportunities to serve and do things for each other, whether it's chores, communal chores. We're not doing it for anyone in particular, we're doing it for the Sangha and doing it for each other. And sometimes we're not doing it for anybody at all. There's this uh, Lumpo, Ch Lumpo Liam, who visits many of the branch monasteries. He kind of teaches his disciples that whatever monastery you're at, you are in, 
you're at, you're in, is your monastery. If you see rubbish on the floor, pick it up. If the toilets are dirty, give them a bit of a clean. And it's very beautiful that selflessness that that comes from. And napoleon has been building temples and bathrooms and kitchens and dwellings, useful buildings in so many monasteries. And he's a happy man. So it's good to kind of learn to pay attention to that coming up in the mind. What about me? I need my time. I need my space. I want some peace of mind. I want some quiet. I'm not suggesting you disregard it and systematically dismiss it. But more often than not, we can leave it alone. We don't have to follow it. And if we do follow it, then also just to watch what happens in the mind. Sometimes it is true, we just do need a rest. We do need to take some quiet time, because the mind is in such a state that if we go out and interact with community, either it'll get worse, or we'll say or do something that we'll regret. And that's a good time to lock ourselves up in our rooms and let the storm subside before coming out again. But very often it is just me wanting what I like. And then to explore, follow it sometimes and look at what it feels like. Do we become happier? Do we become more adaptable, more open? Or do we follow those things and then we start finding ourselves getting cranky and selfish? One of the blessings of my life was that I was able to take a year off from studies after high school before starting university, and I went to Thailand to Wat Pananachat and spent almost a year with Ajahn Pasano <coughs> in the monastery. And my plan was to just spend nine months there, then go and do a spot of traveling in India, go back home to Geneva, start medical studies, and get on with life. But the experience in the monastery really kind of turned me around, and by well, maybe f five or six months had gone by, Ajahn Pasano had the kindness to allow me to ordain as a novice, which they don't usually do on a temporary basis. So I was tasting that freedom that comes from not having involvements in the world that Ajahn Amro was describing this afternoon during the ordination, when ten precepts allow us to put down money. And the number of entanglements that that liberates us from, I couldn't even imagine before doing it. And it was such an incredible experience. I didn't have to go into town anymore. I wasn't exposed to all the things that desire could engage because I had money and I could consider whether I wanted and I could and I should. All of that just falls away because we're not using money all of a sudden. 
And I remember being in, sitting on the balcony of Maikuti, just in the edge of the outer forest in Watnanachat, in the hot season. I was looking out over a mango tree and the Jongrom path, the meditation path next to it. And I realized, even with that little experience I had, just a few months, keeping ten precepts, being part of the Sangha, and having taken that step of renouncing, that what made the joy of monastic life isn't so much something you get, something special that you experience, but it's the joy that arises when there's less suffering. It's like the sky is opening up, all of a sudden there's more space, and less suffering means we're not always feeling cramped and tense and defensive and reactive to life. All of a sudden we can relax, start opening up, and that is joy. So it's not a joy of getting something, it's a joy, the joy of suffering, diminishing, ceasing. And I was starting to think about not going back to Switzerland to study, figuring out what am I going to do there. Just got all, get all tangled up again. This is it, this is the thing to do. And I, had, I hadn't spoken about it with anyone yet, I was just kind of musing away. And uh, Ajahn Tiradamo, who was at that time the abbot of the monastery in Switzerland, came by for a visit. So he comes up and says, how's it going, Masoko? And so we sit down and start chatting. And I just spilled the beans. I hadn't, I hadn't mentioned it to anyone that I was starting to consider staying rather than going home. And uh, he suggested to just stick with my plan of being there for nine months, go back and do a bit of studying and go and, go and look at that world of adult lay life. His experience was that every single Westerner who had ordained at 20 years old had ended up disrobing back then. Now it seems like things have changed and some people ordain at 20 and seem to be doing very well. But he had kept touch with a lot of the monks from the early days who ordained young and disrobed. And even though they may have lived, been living wholesome lay lives, they always had this kind of regret in their heart, saying that their years as a monk was the best thing they had done with their lives. And if they had the opportunity to do it again, they wish they could and not disrobe and stay on. It was very difficult to go back to that. So Gentiradamo was saying it would be really a pity to it would be good if I could stay and it worked out. That would Maybe there was enough barami for that to happen. But on the other hand, if it didn't happen, it would be really sad to live with that regret in the heart for the rest of my life. And it seemed like really good advice. And uh, he suspected that one of the reasons those young men disrobed is because they didn't know what they were leaving. I certainly didn't. I was living with my parents and I came straight to Thailand, to the monastery, all starry-eyed. And so I took his advice and went back and I ended up spending nine years studying, working, before finally I had the feeling that it was enough. I had experienced what I needed to and I was sure I didn't want this. I wanted to go back to the monastic uh, environment. And it really surprised me coming back to the monastery. I had kind of this idealistic expectation that I would come back, pick up meditation where I had left it, picking up, taking on the precepts and getting back into the fray and continuing where I, continuing the work where I left it ten years before. And what surprised me was to realize after a few months 
notice the difference in the momentum there was behind the habit of following my way. When I'd been there at 19, 20 years old, there was a certain experience of it and adapting to the routine of the monastery, going to Taudam, experience. I was, I was uh, there when they had the funeral of Lompocha, which was an incredible experience and was incredibly chaotic as well. And uh, there was a certain ability to adapt to that, to just go with the flow. And then I came back at 30 years old and ordained again to my Anagarika, novice, ordained as a monk. And as I'm going through that, I realize, wow, me has become more important in 10 years. And not in the sense of anything evil or anything like that, but 10 years as a layman, I had basically been f following my wishes. I did studies and stuff like that, so I had conditions I had to work with, but generally speaking, I was earning some money, I could do my thing. If I wanted to go traveling, I would go traveling. If I wanted a nice bicycle, I'd buy a bicycle, and then on sunny days go out. And there's all whole kinds of things, and looking at it is very much developing the habit of following my preferences. And nobody was making me do what I didn't want to do in any serious way. And it was quite remarkable to notice the difference of 10 years of following my preferences. And all of a sudden I was back in the monastery in similar training conditions, and I noticed that the resistance to adapting and doing what was required, that resistance had kind of climbed up a notch a notch or two. And so I found, I found it very, very valuable to kind of really pay attention to that and notice in daily life in the monastery when that kicks in, not wanting to do something and just looking at that and not, not dismissing it, not ignoring it, really noticing because most of the time, following those preferences are not a source of happiness. They're a way of just cultivating self. What I like, not getting involved in things I don't like. And so in monastic life, life there are many opportunities to practice with this any time the community or part of the community gets together and someone asks for volunteers to do something, anything, clean bathrooms, chop carrots, mop the floor, set up the sala, do the invitation for the Dhamma talk, do some upatakking, We always have that opportunity of putting our hand up, and it, not because I want to or because I like to, but just because it's an opportunity to do that, and here I can go against the grain. Yeah, I'll help. basically using the opportunity to cultivate selflessness. Lompo Ganha, who is a very, very impressive monk, whose monastery is next to Ratanawan, where we were living for 10 years, he talks a lot about Siya Sala. In Thai, that means sacrifice, sacrificing, giving up, he emphasizes that, but I have heard more than anything else, siya sala.
And it's interesting to see what happens in the mind when someone tells us or encourages us to sacrifice, to give up something. That part that is entangled with desire, with wanting, with my preferences, my wishes, my likes and dislikes, that part doesn't like hearing that so much. But all we have to do is remember how happiness increases when we let go of self and then sacrifice opportunities to practice, sacrifice giving, letting go, become synonym of cultivating the causes for less suffering and causes for happiness. I think I'll leave it at that for today. <laughs>